so I'll begin today, and uh, my colleague Takeshi, representing the Japanese part of the team, will uh, finish off the presentation. Um, <clears throat> as most of you would know, white label space is the main focus for the funding problem on uh, sponsorship. And uh, for that, we position ourselves as an international team. I'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, but essentially, we don't have any wealthy friends who are willing to put up the cash yet. We'd like to make friends with such people if it's possible. Um, so in the absence of that, we're focused on the sponsorship angle. So, international activities. Let me just uh, the order a bit wrong there. The team actually began in uh, Europe, the European Space Agency, ST facility in the Netherlands. Um, a number of us at that time were working there as engineers and scientists, and we thought we'd like to give this Google and Eric's prize thing a go. And um, uh, before we officially registered, we of course had to separate ourselves from the European Space Agency and uh, became an independent team based just outside ST in Nordvik. Um, so today, uh, the, the Netherlands and the European branch of the team is primarily focused on some of the land of uh, engineering problems. Uh, Australian involvement came a bit later, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. And uh, soon after, we had some Japanese involvement, and the Japanese uh, part of the team is responsible for the development of the rover, and also they have a large role in relation to publicity in that quite interesting country, which you can imagine there's a lot of uh, global brands who uh, very easily sponsor a Google in their X Prize size project if they wanted to. And some news for today, um, we are also looking at establishing uh, some operations here in the US um, that has certain advantages. One of them is ITAR, so we expect that we'll be able to work within and without of the ITAR system as of next year sometime. Uh, we haven't chosen a location yet in the US to, to set up base, but we're quite interested to look around for potential partners who could offer integration facilities. So the idea is that the, the technologies which are not sourced from the US will be imported, let's say, and that, that's how ITAR is supposed to work. It's supposed to block technologies going out, right? So we would bring in those technologies, integrate them in the US with US technologies, and execute the mission at system level as uh, an ITAR, under the ITAR banner, let's say. Um, <clears throat> now, switching to video production, this is a pretty important uh, aspect of the Google Internet Prize. Um, I've got a chart there. We've been doing pretty well with the video production. Um, you can see that there was one quarter a while ago we had a bit of trouble. Um, <clears throat> but um, essentially, uh, what we are aiming to do and what we've shown quite good uh, ability to do is to produce professional uh, content for our videos, but also diverse and, in our opinion, highly relevant to the Google Analytics Prize activities. And what's most interesting to me is that we're doing that with an all-volunteer team. Um, so it's a pretty cost-effective way to meet the requirements of the Google Analytics Prize, and we expect that to continue throughout the rest of our involvement in the competition. So on the right-hand side there is a sample of some of the interesting videos that we've uh, published on. Some of them are probably familiar to you, but uh, you know you see they're covering all sorts of things, not just the simple uh, rover tests, which uh, is, is important, of course, and everyone has to do that. But we're also showing a lot of work on different aspects of the land, um, some of the behind-the-scenes activities with, um, with press conferences in Japan, and um, <clears throat> also uh, we organised a Facebook competition yeah. earlier this year. We're going to keep doing that. We're going to learn from that experience and. Uh, keep trying to uh, raise more awareness of our team around the world. Um, next. So now, now switching to some technical things, the mission architecture has a two-stage direct descent approach, which is also being used by a number of teams here. Um, <clears throat> roughly speaking, the, the lander is uh, being developed in Europe and the rover in Japan, and uh, we're starting to develop a team in Australia to work on the braking stage. Um, we've got uh, compatibility with three different commercial launch services and uh, depending on which uh, launcher we fly with, there'll be different uh, configurations with regard to other spacecraft on that mission. 
So now a little bit about the um, the Netherlands activities. This is um, some uh, some development work on a throttleable engine, which is uh, going quite well. On the on the right hand side, there you see a test rig which we assembled earlier this year. <clears throat> In the middle is a um, a torch igniter, so that um, that's going to be uh, using uh, uh, electric spark to ignite our engine. We're using nitrous oxide and kerosene for this motor, which is a somewhat interesting choice driven by uh, availability issues, as a matter of fact. Quite easy to get hold of those propellants and relatively safe and sufficient performance for our mission on, that, on a, on a two-stage trajectory. Yeah. Um, and uh, on the left, some of the components there for that motor. We're going to go for ablative cooling, which is quite simple and cheap. Um, and uh, we don't need a long burn duration with this two-stage approach, so it's like 25 seconds. should be possible. Now we've just received um, some of the components for the engine itself. On, on the right hand side is uh, a thrust chamber. That's a battleship nozzle, so it's just a chunk of steel. It won't survive 30 seconds, but it will survive a few seconds to test ignition and uh, performance. And on the left hand side there you see some parts of the feed uh, system. So we're, we're actually expecting to, to test that equipment at TNO, which is a major Dutch uh, scientific research organisation, in six weeks' time. Now, independently of that development, at the moment, is some activity on a hovering rocket vehicle. This one, uh, for simplicity, is uh, using a hydrogen dioxide monopropellant. This work's being undertaken in Australia. Um, and on the right-hand side there, you see one of the nozzles which was developed for that. On the left is the, the current concept for that vehicle, and uh, that's moving pretty fast. That, that could easily be flying in a few months. Very simple hovering test, pulse modulated engines, just to get some experience with uh, flying these kinds of vehicles within our team. Now I want to talk a bit more uh, about the braking stage, because I think this is um, an aspect of the Google Inner Enterprise mission which has not received a lot of attention uh, so far but a lot of teams are planning to use such a technique. Um, <clears throat> so, on the left-hand side is the architecture for our mission. Um, we use the Star, uh, currently we're based on the Star 30 BP, which is um, by ATK. This is an uh, off-the-shelf uh, solid rocket motor, and it's not dissimilar from the kind of motor you see on the right-hand side, which was what was used for the NASA Lunar Prospector mission. Um, that's the Star 37 FM. Um, you see the stack there on the left hand side of the blue box. That stack uh, has the, the Lunar Prospector spacecraft on, on top. So in this, in the Lunar Prospector mission, the solid rocket motor was used as a translunar injection stage. Um, there's not a big difference between a translunar injection stage and a braking stage. Um, in, in the case of Lunar Prospector, it was a spin stabilized spacecraft, so they didn't need to de spin after the injection maneuver. But in the case of our Google Inner Enterprise mission, we don't want our rover to get dizzy, so we're going to de-spin with yo-yos. Um, so it's a bit of extra equipment we need to mount to the side of the braking stage. So it, it will look something like the large uh, picture in the middle there, um, but with a yo-yo mounted as well. Now, um, yeah, one more thing I wanted to mention about the, the braking stage. Uh, we choose a spin-stabilized uh, approach because it's cheaper and easier than developing a, th a thrust vector control nozzle of a solid rocket motor. Today, as far as I know, there are no off-the-shelf solid motors in the class range which we're looking for for GLXP type missions which have got uh, thrust vector control, so a nozzle which can move on a flexible seal. That's a key limitation. So um, uh, we decide to avoid the development effort on such a technology and focus on just a simple spin control, so spin up motors and uh, de spin with the yo yo. <coughs> and uh, that probably saves between four and six million dollars of development cost because when you, when you um, develop a new solid rocket motor, you need to fire it to prove that it works. If you can use something that's already flown in space a number of times, and that's the case for these, uh, for these Star Series motors, you don't need to do those development tests. So, saving a lot of money in the early phase of the project there. 
Now, wouldn't it be great if, um, if we could get hold of one of those rocket motors for free? And as a matter of fact, we have. This is a waxwing solid, solid motor. Um, it's been supplied to us from the Australian Space Research Institute. Um, I've actually got about six of them. And the waxwing was used to launch the Prospero satellite on the Black Arrow launcher of the UK in 1971. This picture is from the London Science Museum. And there you see the uh, well, it's sort of exploded view in the sense that it's uh, physically exploded and hanging from the ceiling at different locations. But you see that the, the wax wing is there and above that is the, is the Crossborough satellite. So it's flown in space before, it worked successfully. So we're, we're doing pretty well in terms of the basic propulsion elements for our Crypto uh, Lunar Prize mission. However, time is running out. We're, um, we're unlikely to be able to develop the GNC technologies ourselves and, uh, and the spacecraft bus as a whole. That's uh, quite a lot of effort. So we're quite interested to cooperate with other teams in those areas, and that could be either US teams or non-US teams, as I mentioned before. Um, and so we, we'd be looking at bringing these, some of these propulsion uh, elements to, to bear on such partnerships. Okay. okay uh, I will talk about a little bit about global development in Japan and uh, outreach marketing opportunity in Japan. Uh, this was taken at the uh, East Island, which is uh, famous for the similar island to the moon surface. So the, if the, this blue sky is dark, it could be a uh, lunar surface. <laughs> So a little bit uh, configuration of the rover. The size is uh, less than 10 kilograms, and then the length is 50 centimeters long. And uh, this rover has a relatively uh, big uh, wheels. As you see, uh, diameter is uh, two, sorry, uh, 20 centimeters. Uh, this is coming from the, the research result of Professor Yoshida. Uh, who is a professor of the top university. He also involved in the Hayabusa uh, asteroid sample data project. Uh, he has tremendous uh, experience on the uh, making rovers as, as well as uh, uh, making a satellite, small satellite in his, lab, in, in his laboratory too. So he has a, a two uh, main uh, knowledge of the space technology and the rover technology too. And uh, we are oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we are going to install automotive automatic controlling system. Uh, it's supported by the three D mapping. Then, uh, so this is a serious injury, but sometimes we need one. So uh, we made this. <laughs> it's a. Uh, uh, we invited to an event at the nightclub recently. Then we uh, show up with this one uh, with blue, blue LED light. Uh, who said uh, space engineering is not so sexy? <laughs> yeah, it could be sexy. <laughs> and the other things we are traveling around Japan using this rover showing to kids. And this is a one shot of the uh, game using our rover. So I, I believe some of the kids becoming a, a space engineers in the, in the future. And we also doing the robot driving uh, rotary. It's a giving opportunity for driving this rover on the moon if we succeeded. Uh, for a few minutes for individuals who supported this uh, project. Uh, you also can uh, apply for this rotary if you pay more than $10. Uh, uh, there is a couple of uh, media coverage in Japan. Uh, last year we, we organized a press conference in Japan uh, and uh, after 
in the next morning with um, several, uh, all, most of all of the major newspapers in Japan covered our stories. And after that, we got uh, uh, TV interviews for TV programs on the right side. And, oh, and uh, thanks to these uh, media attentions, we got uh, some of the uh, well, contact from a potential big pro potential sponsor sponsors. Their interest is uh, something uh, advertising opportunity on the moon. So we are trying to close this deal this, uh, in the near future. So in conclusion, <laughs> as I said, uh, robot development on track. We are going to the engineering model soon this summer. And then, uh, as Andrew said, we have a strong <coughs> well, uh, ability in producing videos. And, well, we have an uh, office in Europe, Japan, and soon in the United States, so we can conduct marketing support activities on the global side, global scale. Um, well, we, we are looking for partners on design and branding technologies. Then, well, uh, because we, have, we will have an office in the United States, we will be able to work within either. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions for white label space? <coughs> um, so you mentioned that you were having um, your biggest problem was funding. That was the first thing you mentioned, and then you went on to say that um, you. Well, I guess it seems like you have connections in Japan, and I was actually just at our robotics retreat in San Francisco, and tons of people are going to Japan for funding. Tanto Mobi Hamishesre, Mercasa Bakarami. See? No, but, um, so I was just wondering, um, it seems like you have a connection to Japan, and I don't even think your pitch would have to be that good to, be, to say we can put a Japanese robot on the moon, you know. So I was just wondering why, why you haven't done that, or if there are troubles doing that. Yeah, uh, as you said, there is a lot of uh, interest in Japan for robotics things. But, uh, um, well, in my understanding, uh, the main problem is uh, the, they are so, well, well, how can I say? Well, uh, there's, well, still not, not confidence on the investing in this uh, robotics technologies. Because I, I know some of the advanced companies who are making robotics, but they are still uh, not profitable. So that's why uh, still, uh, they can decide to invest. Question on the breaking stage. Uh, from what I understand, as you described it, the stage could be 45 years plus in age by the time you use it. Um, and so I'll see where this question is going. <laughs> and so I was curious if you looked at um, the risk and reliability associated with the propelling grain and the age relative to uh, its functionality. Uh, actually, before, yes. you, before you answer that, um, uh, I'd like to add to it that I know that on the Contour mission, which had a failure that some think was related to an aging solid rocket motor, they took pains to x-ray the motor before flight to see if it had separated from the sidewall of the, uh, of the rocket motor and so forth. Yeah, we are aware of those issues. Uh, solid rocket propellant doesn't normally last 45 years or is not supposed to. Um, and there's some quite serious things you would need to do if you wanted to use a rocket motor of that age. That's about all I can uh, 
I was going to say, I, I, had, I had a wax ring in my museum in England. So, <laughs> yes, I was looking at that guy. I recognize that person. Would you be interested in uh, establishing your facilities in Orlando or near Orlando, Florida? Because we have a perfect connection that could help you out with obtaining funding as well to do that. Is the weather better than Holland? <laughs> we should check later. <laughs> yeah, so these, Space Florida, one of our partners, tend to be very friendly to uh, new enterprises setting up as well. Any further questions for? Yeah, I'm Todd McIntyre with L3 Communications. Um, you had a chart up there showing S-band and X-band going from the rover to the lander and then beaming back to Earth. Could you describe a little bit of your um, your thoughts on the communications architecture? Uh -huh. Let's see. Uh, the communication between from the moon to the Earth could be uh, X-band. And uh, the, the between the rover and the lander, and we are trying to uh, develop, uh, not, not develop, uh, install the Wi-Fi technology 